Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go through Twitter. I'm gonna give you my uh, financial opinions around whatever's out there uh, on FinTwit, financial Twitter. Uh, I'm going to um, read through whatever I see on there. Uh, I share a lot of posts. I would say that sometimes I have a different financial outlook or paradigm, viewing things a little bit different. Uh, and I'll, I'll share that opinion with everybody. And if you agree with my opinions or if you want to learn about the markets, definitely check out finding-value.com. Uh, the Platinum Membership is a membership that uh, we have right now. You can use the word discount in the coupon code to get a discount. And we have a Platinum Question and Answer session at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time on Sunday coming up. And I answer a whole bunch of different questions. Uh, you can join the community with us. It's a lot of fun. We have a Discord channel as well. And if you don't know we have a Discord channel, check the website. Um, it's for those that are members. Uh, so let's dive in here. Let's take a look at what's going on. Uh, again, if you want to follow me, it's at finding underscore finance. And let's get into this. So it says this Fed hiking cycle is already unique. It would be even more unique if the Fed paused and accelerated hikes again. That has never happened. Usually the Fed keeps on hiking until something breaks and they're forced to cut. Higher for longer is a myth. Well, I want to give my opinions here. Maybe it's a little bit different. So I don't think that the Fed is really doing much uh, of anything that's different this cycle versus any of the other cycles. I think that these cycles here uh, are more or less driven by uh, the demographic and inflation in the system, which is demographic driven for the most part. 90 plus percent. Uh, and these are ends of business cycles. So what he's got here, this is the Fed hiking cycle in terms of its intensity, uh, or just, I should say, they're just, it's just the hi hiking cycles uh, over time. And what I, my opinions around this are, uh, the market forces this to, to some extent. And the market forces it because of inflation. I inflation comes into the system and then people start selling bonds, uh, and that bond selling pressure is what drives these interest rates on up. Um, that is generally driven by credit expansion in the system, by um, ever greater quantity of new loans into the system uh, through the housing market and new construction cycle. I mean, that that's really what it is. The size of these, I think, are the demographic coming into home buying years a slightly larger demographic, uh, and the home balances, whether we're in a deficit or in a surplus of new construction of homes. Uh, right now, we have a deficit of homes. We have a demographic that's strong known as the millennials. And we are hiking this into the strength of that demographic. The size of this, I think, will depend on how high rates get, how sustainable those rates are, and how strong the demographic and the deficit is in the housing market interacting with that demographic. So, um, yes, the affordability can go to crap, but if you've got a really strong demographic, you're still going to have a shortage. <clears throat> and that's what we have now. We have not seen that in the past where interest rates have really slowed down the demographic from buying. Um, we've seen it in the 1970s. We had rates go up and they didn't go up nearly as much on a percentage basis as they have from 22 to 23, uh, where we came from the depths of zero, <laughs> basically, uh, and we've hiked quite rapidly. <clears throat> so uh, that is having an impact on affordability. And we have seen some anomalies in the system where home prices have contracted with under six months of inventory, which has never been seen in the history of the markets. So there is things going on in the markets today that we have not seen in the past. And I don't know what the necessary driver of that is. Maybe um, countries are just dumping bonds in mass and they're letting the interest rates go up to absorb that selling pressure with the interest rates going up, creating natural demand from the market and it is having an impact on perhaps the housing market. 
So maybe the housing market isn't the sole driver of it. Uh, there might be other motives or, or, or reasons behind uh, the increase of interest rates moving as fast as they have. Uh, and that's what I'll leave it at. Which means, you know, there could be countries dumping bonds and stuff like that. We've got, um, this is posted, this is Grady. I think Grady's actually pretty solid. I like his charting. Uh, he's got a lot of really good things that he looks at. He says, posted on XAU, uh, which is gold priced in Canadian dollars. Uh, look at the breakout months ago, still holding. Gold priced in Canadian leading to, or leading should be a good side for gold. A breakout, a retest, and then something that looks like it wants to go uh, higher to the upside. So nice chart looking, you know, nice looking chart there. And it looks great for a potential break to the, uh, to the upside. Uh, here's something that I thought was interesting. <clears throat> Let's dive in. So we've got uh, traffic uh, to home builder websites hit an all time high on March 7th. Yep, even way beyond any time in 2020 to 2022. Wait, I thought that the housing market was going to crash. If it's going to crash, why is there all time highs on home builder websites? What is that about? Is the demographic and the deficit in the system real then? And perhaps maybe the Federal Reserve knows that this demographic's coming into home buying years, and perhaps they need to keep interest rates high to slow this demographic down from creating inflation. He says traffic since 1 2019 broken out by source of traffic. Ad spend is purple, organic is blue, direct, most repeat visitors is yellow. You can see the blue came on up. And we're coming on up there with the yellow for sure. Look at that, coming right on up. And then ad spend continues to go higher. Uh, so that's what we, we're seeing in home traffic, or, or I should say traffic into home builders uh, on their internet sites. So, so that is very interesting there. Uh, coming on back, <clears throat> we got another one from Grady. He says that that is one very clear chart. Either it breaks out above the pink doom arc, or it breaks down below the yellow line. And what this is, this is a ratio chart. Uh, so this ratio decides whether silver will take the lead in the precious metals bull market, uh, or if it will be platinum. Uh, I own both of uh, of both of those metals, so it doesn't matter which one leads, which one lags. I don't really care. Uh, I know that uh, platinum is very cheap to all the other metals uh, in comparison when you do ratio analysis, but. This one here, you can see he's got an arc here. Uh, it is starting to come on up. And if this is uh, this is silver divided by platinum, so if it breaks to the upside, silver will be a leader. If this breaks and comes back down, platinum will be the leader. Um, I don't know, or I don't think it really matters which one's necessarily going to be the leader. Um, and we could be early enough where this breaks out for a small period of time uh, and then heads lower. Uh, but looking at this... <clears throat> This is 80 ounces to buy one ounce. Yeah, that's that's about right. I'm just looking at this. If this is really SL1 divided by PL1, this ratio should be different. It sounds like this is actually hmm, interesting. I'm just looking at the, the, the 80 here. Maybe he's got it in a different thing. This is futures. Oh, on monthlies. Uh, coming on down, it says that is a 30-year trend line break uh, down and strong recovery. You do not see that every day. Uh, and that is an absolutely massive blue rising ascending triangle, which is usually a bullish pattern. Now, this is the Hang Seng Index for Hong Kong uh, monthly. We had a false breakout, and then they pumped the system. So I do expect this to go to the upside. And that liquidity that they're pumping into the system uh, over there is also going to drive demand for commodities. Uh, we have <clears throat> basically two strong forces opposing each other. We've got loosening of credit and a bottoming of a cycle over in China. And at the same time, <clears throat> in America, we are tightening our liquidity. So we've got two offsetting forces going at each other right now. Another one with Grady he says, platinum price in euro uh, has a very interesting chart. That's a probable eight-year-long orange inverse head and shoulders pattern. Its measured price target is right up there at the highs. 
This chart gives a hint of good things to come. So it's a shoulder, head, shoulder, uh, and we could potentially break to the upside given time. Uh, I know a lot of people, when the sentiment gets a little bit negative, they just go full negative. Um, I kind of, how can I say it? My sentiment never really changes if the underlying structural market conditions uh, are favorable. And what I mean by that is the fundamentals of oil and all these different commodities, nothing's been fixed. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have a short-term pullback in the markets. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't have a recession. But the recession slows down demand. It doesn't fix the underlying supply problem that we have in the market. In fact, a slowdown or recession will make it worse with time because it will delay investment and ultimately delay the problem, making the problem worse for the most part. Because there is declines, and if prices go down far enough, it'll exacerbate those declines. It will pull back any sort of investment that's going to go into it, and it's just going to delay everything and make the problem worse. Uh, because when demand comes roaring back, we're going to be that much further behind uh, in our investments into that commodity. Uh, this is another Chinese stocks, the FXI. Uh, we had a false breakout, and then we slingshotted to the upside, now doing a retest. Um, that's what I look for, these false breakouts. And for some reason, I don't know why, we were getting a lot more false breakouts. I think they're trying to get people to think that this is broken to the downside, they all get short and then they just squeeze them all up uh, as it rips up to the upside. Uh, it's pretty common to see this. <clears throat> That's for sure. Now here is uh, SRS Rock report. He says, highest gold cost ever in 2022. This is the cost curves that I talk about. He says, the top gold miners cost of production for quarter four 2022 and interesting fundamentals. Nothing's changed in the past 50 years. Gold market price is based on the gold mining industry's cost of production. Uh, so what happens is um, prices go up. They go to a level where the supply exceeds the demand, and then they fall back down to the cost curve. And it just goes over and over and over over time. <clears throat> what he's saying is those cost curves, the low end of the curve, continues to bump higher, uh, increasing the lows of that metal. So when we have higher highs and higher lows, the lows generally hug the cost curve uh, of commodities. Uh, here's Josh Young. He says, one more thought as shale oil well productivity declines are better publicized, more attention may be drawn to company production base decline rates. Oil sands producers get a lot of attention for their low declines. But there are also low decline conventional oil producers. Uh, these are the Canadian Select uh, ENP based decline rates. And you can see we go from 7% all the way to uh, 43%. These are probably higher cost producers. These are going to be some of the shale plays. Uh, generally, the shale guys have higher decline rates. It doesn't mean that they're horrible. Uh, they could have a bunch of inventory to drill if this is where the new supply is coming from. Uh, but there's also other companies that have low decline. Uh, a lot of the low, low decline stuff <clears throat> is oil sands. <clears throat> so oil sands is also a stable way to play this market where they have low declines and they can um, mine it. I think a lot of them are mining or in, in situ type um, mining or, or, or extraction methods. And we can play it that way if they've got nice, uh, solid oil there. So this is a chart that shows those decline rates. I'm not going to go over every single one. Uh, Josh Young says, Buffett keeps buying Occidental Petroleum, Oxy, a large independent Permian-focused oil producer. Uncle Warren bought 6 million more shares of Oxy between last Friday and today. Now at 200 million shares, 22% of outstanding shares, not including preferred shares. So. Warren Buffett continues to, to basically load up in oil. So what is he doing that basically we're doing as well? Um, I think he knows what we know. There's a supply problem coming, and I don't think it's going to be solved. Now, could there be problems in the short term where we get a pullback or something like that uh, from a slowdown in the markets? Yes, that's very well possible. I see it as a buying opportunity for a long-term hold. 
Um, and that's my mindset and that's my paradigm. I'm not going to sit here and try to trade this stuff in and out. I, I just, it, I think that we are close to a deficit in oil here where demand exceeds um, the supply worldwide pumping capacity of oil. And it's like, I don't want to be sitting on the sidelines when that happens. Uh, but that's my take. And obviously everybody can have a differing opinion on it. Now here's uh, another one. He says, looks like China's getting ready for war. Remember, their window of demographic opportunity closes at 2030 due to population aging. Question is, do they move on Taiwan or join Russia against Ukraine? Uh, so forth. So it says, China is selling their U.S. treasuries. And this is what I meant by the treasuries. Maybe there's countries dumping treasuries uh, and pushing interest rates higher than what uh, I would, that, that what you'd think the market would, would push it. It says, meanwhile, the People's Bank of China has added 102 uh, tons of gold in the past four months. Total gold reserves now amount to 2,050 tons. Uh, China's clearly trying to limit their counterparty risk in a conflict. That could be a potential uh, thing where they are going to war and they're going to reduce their holdings of U.S. Treasuries because it might be against uh, the United States, not directly, but it could be against one of our allies or whatever the heck it is. Uh, this was an ins excellent interview with hedge fund manager Cuppy talking about pain from the Fed rate hikes, oil, uranium, nuclear power, and gold. Uh, he holds a very similar view uh, to what I do. Um, he thinks there's going to be a deficit starting in the back half of 2023, uh, accelerating to a very large deficit going forward after that. <clears throat> so he's very bullish on energy, uh, as am I. And I'm kind of just taking the, the view that I'm going to stay in it, stay long, and buy the pullbacks. At least that's been my uh, opinions there. And we've already gone through that, so I'll end it there. Um, lots of information there to, to kind of chew on. Uh, I like keeping it energy-related because I think that's where the opportunities are. Uh, I also like precious metals quite a bit as you can kind of diversify your holdings out of the system with that. Uh, we also, you know, I'm seeing a lot of stuff talking about Biden wanting to increase capital gains tax and all these different taxes, business tax, blah, 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 whatever it is. Uh, that might be another way to diversify out of the system for a while where you've got wealth out of the system, which makes it a lot harder to tax. Just another, you know, thing to think about. But uh, that's what I've got for today, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Give me a thumbs up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, check out the website. Definitely something to check out there. Uh, and, meet, and, and meet you guys and or see you on Sunday if you're already a, a member. Uh, 5 p.m. Don't forget about it. Uh, we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.